I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President Trump chooses Jerome Powell to become the next chair of the U.S. Central Bank. Trump says the Federal Reserve Board member has the wisdom and leadership to guide the U.S. economy through any challenges. If confirmed by the Senate, Powell would succeed Janet Yellen when her term ends in February. President Trump wants the GOP tax overhaul signed into law in time for the holidays. We're working to give the American people a giant tax cut for Christmas. We are giving them a big, beautiful Christmas present in the form of a tremendous tax cut. It will be the biggest cut in the history of our country. Democrats say the plan primarily benefits large corporations and wealthy investors. Trump's national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, says North Korea could be returned to the list of countries the U.S. believes sponsor terrorism. McMaster's comments come on the eve of President Trump's trip to Asia. The 12-day trip kicks off on Friday. And former Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort and his longtime business associate Rick Gates will remain on house arrest, at least through the weekend. A judge declined a request from Manafort's lawyer to remove GPS monitoring. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Apple beats estimates for the fourth quarter just as the most advanced iPhone ever begins selling in stores worldwide. Details of my conversation with CEO Tim Cook as the clock winds down to the official start of the iPhone 10 era. Plus, Alibaba shatters second quarter forecasts on its earnings day and plans to go full steam ahead the rest of the year. How China's e-commerce king's expansion into new businesses helped nearly double revenue. And my wide-ranging conversation with former Twitter CEO Dick Costolo, his take on holding big tech accountable for fake news on their platforms and intensifying the crackdown on trolls and bots online. But first, to our lead, and that is Apple, out with quarterly earnings. The company forecasting holiday sales that exceeded analyst estimates, suggesting strong demand and few supply issues for the iPhone X. This is Apple's most important product launch in years. Shares hit records this week and continue to rise in late trading. The iPhone X going on sale in stores worldwide starting now. We've actually got live pictures for you of the Apple store in Sydney. These people have been waiting outside overnight. Uh, more than 200 folks waiting for the iPhone 10. They just opened the doors. Uh, consumers walking inside, employees clapping, lots of photographs happening there. Also, uh, people waiting outside of stores in Tokyo and Singapore to get their hands on this new phone. Joining me now here in the studio, Forrester Research Analyst Julie Osk. Uh, Julie, let's start with the numbers. They look good, and especially the forecast, which means the outlook for the iPhone 10 as of now is strong. Yeah, no, I think so. Everything looks to be that way. Um, I mean, I, I think it's certainly a bold move to sell a device for $1,000, but it proves that demand for their devices, you know, remains strong. Now, we've been looking at wait times of five to six weeks, uh, which is longer than any phone previously and suggests some supply issues. But I did ask Tim Cook about this when, when I uh, spoke to him on the phone just moments ago, uh, and, and he didn't seem too worried about it. He said, this is simply the most advanced iPhone ever. We're just getting started, but I'm really happy with how the ramp is going. I think we will make some reductions in wait times, he says, today or tomorrow, so we can expect to see that wait time go down. Yeah, so I think, you know, that's definitely the case. I think, you know, whenever, you know, like, no organization builds capacity to hit peak demand. So, you know, certainly they've been producing these devices for a while. And I think the other thing that Apple does well is they always meet or beat expectations. So while they may be setting expectations of four to six weeks, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if consumers don't start getting them in the mail sooner than that. Uh, what's your big takeaway when you look at the numbers, knowing that this is the quarter coming up, we're looking at people uh, in line for their phone in Sydney? <laughs> well, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's exciting for Apple. I think when you look at the iPhone X, um, 
you know, that certainly that represents almost 70% of their revenue. I think it's going to be interesting to see the details of the earnings release, though, just in terms of what's the other category doing, that the number one watchmaker in the world, you know, are they going to, at what point are they going to break out devices like that? And certainly I think there's also just a keen eye on their services business to see to what extent that's growing. Which, by the way, it grew 34% uh, year over year, the fastest it's ever grown. My question is, how long can they keep up that kind of growth? Well, certainly it's always hard to get a big growth number, the bigger base there is, but there's only going to be more momentum in this market because the more devices I own, if I own a watch and a smartphone and a tablet and a computer and then the HomePod when it launches in December, there's only more incentive for me to sign up for services like Apple Music and other services that can work across all of these devices. So this ecosystem of devices begins to play in their favor. Let's also talk about China. Apple returned to growth in China. There's been you know, some big questions about whether people are really going to want to pay up uh, for a phone it's this expensive when you have alternatives that are half the price or less. I asked him Cook about China and he said, we've returned to growth there. The Mac was strong, our best quarter in mainland China ever. Our services hit an all-time high in China. iPad grew double digits in China. So in addition to the iPhone, the other businesses are doing very well. And specifically in response to this question of whether people will buy the iPhone 10, he said, we'll see, but I suspect that China will really love the iPhone 10. Yeah, I think there's no doubt they're doing well here. And I mean, he, certainly he has more data than we do, and he'll probably talk more about that. But, you know, this is a bit of a halo device, right? This is kind of like going back to the early generations of the iPhone 1 or 2 when people slept, like, camped out outside the stores. But I think what you may see, though, is there's a lot of demand for this product. But what we may see, though, is a slowdown in, like, how frequently I refresh that. Mm. Right? At $1,000, it's now cost what my laptop does. You know, do we refresh our laptops every two years, or are we going to see people get closer to a 30-month cycle rather than a 24-month cycle so that they can uh, justify the cost on a month-by-month -month basis. Tim Cook told me he's pleased with the iPhone 8, 8 Plus sales so far, but are you, are you at all concerned about the iPhone 10 cannibalizing sales of the iPhone 8? Well, I think, you know, Apple's good at this. This is what they do. They bring out a new product. This year is unique in that there's two new products, but then they're very good at adjusting the prices on the other, mar on the other products that have been out in the market longer, and they tend to still do well with those products. So uh, as we watch the rollout happening around the world over the next 24 hours, what are you going to be watching for? We'll probably be watching, to, you know, I don't know if there's like something specific we're watching for, but, you know, I'll be interested to see to what extent they release numbers on what the forecast is, you know, what the pre-orders are, um, how much demand there is for the device. You know, I hate to say, you know, anecdotally, the, de the demand seems to be very strong here in San Francisco. All right. Well, we are listening into the earnings call right now. We'll bring highlights as we have them. I know you're going to be listening to that call and um, we're going to be uh, catching up uh, with this call throughout the show. Thanks Thank so you. much. Julie Osk, Forrester Thank Research you. Analyst. Well, we continue to watch the price of Bitcoin move higher. The digital currency surged above $7,000. The latest boost in the price comes after the CME Group, the world's largest exchange owner, said it plans to introduce Bitcoin futures by the end of the year. Earlier on Bloomberg Television, Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein gave his outlook on the cryptocurrency. I have a level of discomfort with it, as I have a dis level of discomfort with anything that's new. But I've learned over the years that there's a lot of things that work out pretty well that I don't, that I don't love. Meantime, another banking CEO also commented on Bitcoin. Speaking at a news conference in Zurich, Credit Suisse CEO Tijan TM called the digital currency the very definition of a bubble. Coming up, we will discuss Alibaba's continued dominance in the Chinese e-commerce market as the company turns in another blockbuster earnings report. And as we head to break, take another look at this live shot from Sydney, where the time is Friday, 8 a.m., the iPhone 10 now on sale at the Apple Store. This is Bloomberg. Well, after a year of monster growth, Alibaba has raised its outlook for full year revenue growth. This after China's biggest e-commerce company blew past forecasts in its latest round of earnings. Alibaba's results were boosted thanks to its core e-commerce business and cloud computing. For more reaction, we're joined by Kevin Carter, founder of the Emerging Markets Internet and e-commerce ETF known as EMQQ. Alibaba is the top holding in that index. So what was your biggest takeaway from the numbers? Well, I think the biggest takeaway was acceleration. I mean, it's, it's amazing that a company of that size can grow grow at the rate it's growing 
but the, the growth rates actually accelerated. I think from a year, 18 months ago, it was growing about 40%. Last quarter it was in the low 50s, and this morning was 61 percent. So, it, what are your thoughts on the new retail plan? Well, I think uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. I, uh, you know, you see a lot of the same things happening here now, where you know Amazon's bought Whole Foods, gives them distribution points or physical locations in a, a more diverse area, and. Uh, both JD and Alibaba have been pretty aggressive in this regard. Both are partnering with some of the gas station operators. So I think it's exciting and a, a new chapter of uh, uh, online to offline. We're looking ahead to Singles Day very soon. Uh, how big do you think Singles Day is going to be this year and how significant? Yeah. You know, one of the things that's been interesting is the Singles Day growth numbers year over year have not been as great as the annualized numbers uh, for revenue. So we're forecasting, uh, I think, a pretty conservative 20 to 22 billion, but uh, that'll be up from 17.8 billion. I think it could exceed that, but certainly will be at least 20 and possibly 22. And w one of the things I think sort of exciting about Singles Day now is it's not just uh, people buying uh, physical goods. Uh, you may have seen Zhang An Insurance went public uh, a couple months ago in Hong Kong. Alibaba is an investor in that, and they sold 100 million uh, uh, return insurance uh, contracts that day alone. I think it was something like 13,000 a second. So uh, I think it'll be an exciting single stay as it is. And uh, I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll have 61% growth as the uh, quarter had. How do you think about the future of Alibaba in the context of the Chinese economy at large? How optimistic are you that the Chinese economy will continue to grow as it has? Well, I'm, I'm very optimistic and confident it'll continue to grow. I mean, the growth rate will slow down, as we've seen for the last decade, and you know, it'll go from 6.5% to 6 to 5, and that's uh, almost certain. But it's uh, the, the breadth of involvement they have in the economy. Because a lot of people don't realize the number of investments that they have in whether it's DD uh, or even in other countries like Paytm. Uh, in India, so I think it's not just e-commerce with Alibaba. It's it's Alipay, it's payments, it's physical locations. Uh, I think there's a lot of lot of growth still left for for the sector and for Alibaba. The CEO was asked on the call about the outlook for subscribers. Uh, didn't give a straightforward answer, but talked about how the program is different from Amazon Prime. What is your outlook for subscribers? Well, I think uh, I mean you're right. They didn't give very clear guidance. I think. It, the user base numbers are going to have to flatten out. I mean, they've got a pretty decent percentage of the population, so I think flattening will definitely be the uh, uh, the curve in terms of members. But but in terms of uh, amount spent by members, I mean, I think that number still has a, a lot of room to go up and into different directions. Shares have been surging. Can the share price continue to grow as sure. it has? Well. Um, in the long term, uh, share prices follow mm -hmm. earnings, and uh, in the short term, they follow sentiment. I think that uh, valuations are still quite reasonable. I think that if you look at the whole sector of emerging markets, internet companies, the PE multiple is maybe 35 to 38 uh, for Alibaba in particular, about the same looking forward. But you've got 60% revenue growth for Alibaba and 40% growth for the sector. So on a, on a PE to growth basis, it's about one. Uh, whereas the S&P 500 has a P.E. of 25 and has less than 5% revenue growth. So uh, I think uh, investors with a mid to long term uh, time frame will do quite well. How much growth are you expecting to see in the cloud division in particular and how critical is that cloud unit to Alibaba's future? Well, they just announced another 100% growth quarter, and I think the cloud and, the, and, the, and even here for, for Amazon, the web services, uh, I think uh, both of those businesses are still very much in their early stages. And I, I know as an entrepreneur, uh, I'm just about to sign my first sort of cloud-related uh, deals uh, with, with Amazon Web Services, so I, I, I kind of think it's probably still quite early. Uh, for that business in China uh, for Alibaba as well, as right. evidenced by the 100% growth. Number. All right, Kevin Carter, founder of EMQQ, Alibaba, one of the biggest holdings. Thanks so much, Kevin. Thanks for having me. For stopping by.
Well, a new chapter in the bitter legal battle between Apple and Qualcomm. Qualcomm has sued Apple, accusing the iPhone maker of failing to abide by the terms of a software license. The chipmaker filed the suit against Apple Wednesday in California State Court in San Diego. The two companies are embroiled in an escalating dispute over technology licensing fees that Qualcomm charges for patents that cover the basics of how mobile phone systems work. Apple says Qualcomm is unfairly charging too much and leveraging its strong market position in chips illegally. Coming up, House Republicans unveiled a tax cut plan today that impacts big tech immensely. We'll give you all the details. That's next. And once again, take another look at this live shot from inside the Apple store in Sydney, where current time just after 8 a.m. on Friday, the highly anticipated iPhone 10 on sale now and around the world over the next 24 hours. We will be watching. President Trump said today that semiconductor company Broadcom will be returning its headquarters to the United States from Singapore. CEO Hock Tan joined the president in the Oval Office for the announcement, where the president touted the amount of money that will come into the U.S. as a result of the deal. Their move back to the United States and to the United States is something very, very special and very important. And you've been seeing this happen with numerous companies and at a minimum expansions and sometimes plants. With this commitment, more than $20 billion in annual revenue will come back to our cities, towns, and the American workers. House Republican leaders rolled out their sweeping tax plan in Washington this Thursday. Among the highlights, cutting the corporate tax rate to 20 percent and reducing the number of individual brackets, plus eliminating the estate tax. However, several of the biggest corporations in the U.S., including Apple, would no longer be able to escape taxes on the trillions in overseas profits that they have accumulated. According to an estimate by Goldman Sachs, U.S. companies have stockpiled as much as $3.1 trillion offshore. The largest stockpiles belong to Apple at more than $200 billion, followed by Microsoft, Cisco, Alphabet, and Oracle. Joining us now with how this impacts big tech and perhaps venture capital, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Million. Mark, so what does this mean for a company like Apple? For a company like Apple, they, they generate um, a lot of their profits locally, so the 20% tax rate is a good thing, but they also have an immense amount of money overseas. Um, so the 12% tax on overseas cash is a big source of concern, and uh, they're gonna continue to tax foreign subsidiaries going forward, assuming that this tax plan passes, which is a big assumption. But uh, not great for big international companies keeping a lot of money overseas. Apple has nearly $250 billion overseas. You know, part of this, you know, a, a, we're looking at a rate of as high as 12% when we thought it would be closer to 10%. I know Bloomberg has been talking to analysts uh, that say this is borderline business unfriendly. Um, I did speak with Luca Maestri, the CFO of Apple, just a, a few moments ago um, a, a, a ahead of the earnings call, and he told me that. We've always been a very strong advocate for comprehensive corporate tax reform. It will drive the free flow of capital. It'll drive investment in the U.S. It will drive job creation in the U.S. However, he said, we, of course, don't know the details. And, you know, given the gridlock in Washington, what we see now is perhaps nothing close to what we'll see later. I think that's the key of it. They're, they're probably telling investors, don't worry too much right now. This isn't even the final tax plan. They're going to continue to make markups to this. And... It may not even pass. I mean, they, this, they've got a very ambitious, like, month and a half to get this through, which is kind of crazy in the world of Washington. So explain the impact you expect this to have on the private markets. As it stands now, say this plan that we see now is what? Yeah, what well, it's got a lot of great things for private companies. Um, for example, there was a lot of talk, especially during the campaigns, about this tax policy called carried interest, which would have affected venture capitalists quite a bit because they make a lot of their compensation 
from from these carried interest tax exemptions. So that didn't show up in the bill. So VCs were psyched about that. Mm. Um, and the uh, the venture capital trade group has also uh, told uh, my colleague Lizette Chapman in an interview that they're expecting um, changes to the way that startup employees exercise stock options, which allows them to defer when they have to pay taxes on a huge chunk of their their compensation, which they get in stock. Um, so that w is a great thing for for startup employees out here. Um, the the one uh, unexpected caveat is uh, this tax on university endowments, which are huge investors into venture capital funds and and hedge funds and private equity. Uh, so they're they're going to now be paying a 1.4 percent tax, and they're they're a little freaked out about it that they're targeting universities. What does it mean for individuals, specifically Silicon Valley billionaires? I know, yeah, not not as great as they might have hoped. Um, I mean, they they tend to skew liberal anyway, and they're not as sensitive to taxes as as other uh, wealthy people. But yeah, they they didn't get the uh, the high end tax break that the Republicans, especially the, the president and the uh, the le leaders in the Republican Party, had been pushing for in the Senate. Um, and also the uh, the exemption for electric cars getting you know tax breaks on electric cars going away so all the Tesla lovers out here um, may not be able to get their tax breaks on. so in terms of process what are we expecting in the next months uh, just a lot more gridlock a lot more debate it's gonna be a race it's gonna be a race to the finish um, and there's uh, they, they're already describing this as like a, a watered-down tax bill um, now that the details are public, especially to the Democrats in the House, um, there's going to be, I'm sure, a lot of infighting over, over what stays in, what's, what gets pulled out, and, and among the, the wider Republican Party in the House. And that's just the House. All right. Mark Millian, our Bloomberg Tech team, thanks for breaking it down. Coming up, big tech CEOs declined to testify before Congress this week. We found out what Twitter's former top executive thinks about this week's Capitol Hill hearings. That is next. We'll hear from Dick Costello. And once again, take another look at a live shot from inside the Sydney Apple Store. The current time, almost 8.30 a.m. Friday, the highly anticipated iPhone 10 on sale now. And Apple CEO Tim Cook is currently speaking on the company's earnings call. As we approach the holiday season, he just said we expect expected to be the biggest quarter ever. We will continue to mon monitor headlines from the call. We are listening in right now. This is Bloomberg. for Twitter, Google and Facebook were being grilled by lawmakers on Capitol Hill. But while their counsels were forced to answer about how possible Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. elections occurred on their platforms, their CEOs were notably absent. Earlier, I spoke with former Twitter CEO Dick Costolo to get his thoughts on what went down before Congress this week and began by asking just how much responsibility these three companies bear. I think I would separate it into two things. I think they have a responsibility once they've understood the problem and the issue to discover the scope of it and then go address it. And I think they're doing that. I think it would be a mistake to say they bear responsibility for missing it. Um, this is stuff that's come to light uh, after the elections. It wasn't anything I think anyone knew had happened in previous elections, so make sure we get out ahead of it this time. Uh, everyone's been seemingly surprised by it. Um, and it's now a matter of doing the detective work to figure out just how deep and broad it was and then go attack that as quickly as possible. Twitter has already announced some changes. What changes do you think Twitter should Well, I think the, the Jack has made a uh, pretty uh, broad and aggressive statement about we're going to be more transparent about, um, about political ads that are purchased, all political ads that are purchased, and we're going to be more aggressive on abuse. Um, I think those are great steps. Um, and uh, as I've as I said, when I was CEO, I'd like to see us be a lot more aggressive. Uh, so I'm happy to see him doing that. The ads are one thing, but some people say the ads really aren't the real problem. It's the number of fake accounts, the number of uh, people pretending to be somebody else. 
Yeah, I mean, you saw, um, again, Twitter said yesterday, I think, in the hearings that they think 5% uh, of the accounts on the platform are bots. Um, Do you agree with that? Because uh, uh, so, some people think it's a lot, it's a lot more. Well, uh, again, the, there are two things I'd say about this. One, I trust the folks inside the company if they're um, giving a, a number publicly, as particularly in front of a Senate and uh, House hearings, I expect that they um, mm -hmm. believe that that's the correct number. Uh, the, the, the thing you have to remember about there's the, the sort of um, sometimes there are researchers that come out and say, well, the number's actually a lot higher than that, and here's our data. They're going off some of these raw API feeds. And by raw API feeds, I mean they're looking at the, the tweets that are coming through these um, programming interfaces before Twitter delivers them uh, to users. Is it true that to some degree these networks are essentially ungovernable because you have hundreds of people trying to monitor more than 300 million accounts? No, I don't think that's true. I think you can apply um, um, all sorts of um, machine learning techniques and other kinds of algorithms uh, uh, to do the things that you should be doing and be doing a better job of, like uh, protecting the community and making sure that um, the information that's being delivered on the platform to the greatest extent possible is not uh, uh, you know, foreign propaganda and, and uh, fake news, to use the sort of the term of the day. Keith Raboy of Coastal Ventures was on the show yesterday and he called these proceedings essentially fraudulent. Actually, he used the word fraudulent because that doesn't he, be surprise me. <laughs> he believes that it's completely ridiculous to blame these companies, these social networks for, you know, potentially swaying the election <clears throat> and spreading misinformation when there's a broad spectrum of, you know, misinf what misinformation actually is. Um, what do you think? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to take a more uh, uh, nuanced approach to the answer. Um, look, on the one hand, you could say, well, people lie on TV all the time. You can point to, you know, uh, one or two news networks and say, well, that was not, that was not even remotely true. So uh, it's not Facebook, Twitter, and Google's problem. It's everybody's problem. Uh, uh, my, my, position, my position is a little bit more, look, we all have to take responsibility for trying to prevent this from happening again. Um, and as the leaders in the technology uh, field that are delivering a lot of this information to users using algorithm, algorithms that we think are best suited to deliver them the right information, we need to bear responsibility for addressing this. Uh, I do think, I watched some of the hearings yesterday morning and was very proud of um, Sean Edgett uh, from t Twitter's council who is, who is there um, and is one of the more ethical people you, you, you could ever get to meet. I do think that it would have been better if those hearings were more about problem solving and finding solutions and less about political theater. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get these long-winded statements um, that come with um, sort of questions in the form of an accusation that seem to be designed to make the um, person answering the question look either complicit or stupid. You know, choose one. Um, and I would like to see them be more about Let's work together to find solutions and problem solve instead of, um, instead of blaming people and trying to get on the evening news. Do you think Twitter is a media company? And if so, what's its responsibility to vet what's published? Uh, it's certainly in the media business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a sense in Silicon Valley that these companies are platforms and only responsible for distributing information and not making editorial decisions. Um, the fact is, and I think Jack has acknowledged this, is that these companies, all of them, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, make editorial decisions all the time. We're going to suspend this account. Uh, this doesn't meet our standard for uh, nudity or mm -hmm. pornography or whatever, so it can stay. This one uh, doesn't meet it, so it has, to, it has mm -hmm. to go. So I think that these companies need to, need to admit, if you will, hey, we make editorial decisions all the time, and we need to live with that and understand that being, part, being in the media business, um, even if we're a technology company, means that we're going to have to uh, take more responsibility for, for those editorial decisions. So what are some solutions as you see them? <clears throat> I mean, one sort of simple... You know how hard this one, is. It, yeah. L listen, also, let's be clear. The ads aren't, like, coming from, like... Uncle Vladimir, you know, wanting to pay for Cornhusker moms for Trump. That's not like, it, you know, it's not that simple, right? I do think um, you should probably only take um, political ads 
from organizations that are registered in the country in which the election is taking place. That sort of seems like an easy one. Um, and things of that, things like that, that um, don't let the election um, fall outside the bounds of that, that, that um, region in which the election is taking place, mm -hmm. or, or its influence start to extend out of bounds of the region in which that election is taking place. That seems like sort of a simple and obvious one to me. The problem with, again, the problem with legislation around just things like transparency are, are that the organizations aren't going to name themselves like you know, Soviet, the, you know, the former Soviet Republic of so and so, for they're going to name themselves something that sounds like, you know, hey, that sounds like the Iowa or mm -hmm. California, you know, mm -hmm. uh, grassroots Republican organization or Democrat organization. So it's got to be more about making sure that the organizations themselves are registered um, and paying taxes and filing their forms, et cetera, in the countries or regions in which these elections are taking place. You've been very vocal about harassment <clears throat> on these platforms, and I'm curious for your reaction. Twitter has said they're going to change the way they approach harassment. They're going to be more transparent about the way that they approach harassment. This in the wake of uh, the Me Too campaign, the Harvey Weinstein allegations, actress Rose McGowan, her account getting suspended as she was talking about mm -hmm. being sexually assaulted. Do you think it's too little too late for Twitter or that Twitter can actually get this problem under control? I think it's a problem that they should address. Jack knows they need to address it and they should be more aggressive in addressing it. And the same was true when I was CEO. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's too little too late. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most vital and important platforms in the world. It's literally the way to get information or your opinion about something out in a moment. Um, and it will be that way for years to come. And, you know, great, start now, get more aggressive now. Is it a matter of you know being more also I don't think it's is let me just add one thing to that you know the word that's used is transparent I think what would also be helpful is for um, these organizations to provide context for why a certain decision was made it, it's one thing to just say we made this decision because of this specific tweet but then you know people might draw the wrong conclusions from mm -hmm. that it would be helpful I get how hard this is believe me you could spend all day doing it um, but it would be helpful to say we made this decision about this specific piece of content for these kinds of reasons um, and that might not solve all your problems or answer everybody's questions mm -hmm. but at least it'll start to give people a better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes and why some of these issues are as challenging as they are. That was my interview there with former Twitter CEO Dick Costello and a reminder Bloomberg LP the parent company of Bloomberg News is developing a global news network for Twitter. While American lawmakers are not the only ones concerned about alleged Russian interference in their political processes, the UK elections regulator is looking at whether Russia tried to use social media to illegally influence the Brexit vote. The commission said it's speaking to both Facebook and Twitter to see who paid for political advertising in the run-up to the June 2016 referendum that saw Britain vote to leave the EU. Coming up, two of the major players in the meal kit delivery world are heading in opposite directions. What the latest numbers tell us about HelloFresh and Blue Apron. And we continue to monitor headlines from the Apple earnings call. Here's what CEO Tim Cook said about the company's explosive growth in the wearables market. Our entire wearables business was up 75% year over year in the fourth quarter. And in fiscal 2017, already generated the annual revenue of a Fortune 400 company. Blue Apron is struggling to stem the bleeding since it went public. Shares fell to the lowest level since the meal kit delivery service launched its IPO in June. This despite third quarter revenue beating analyst estimates. The issue, a forecast that shows growth is slowing down. Blue Apron is facing increased competition from competitors like HelloFresh and Amazon. The company is also reeling from recent rounds of layoffs and problems getting their fulfillment centers in order. Joining me now to discuss, Alex Barinka with Bloomberg News in New York. So Alex, talk about the latest stock dive. What happened? Uh, today was not a great day for Blue Apron on their third quarter earnings report. As you said, uh, sales did beat estimates, but those estimates had come down a bit as folks are not too uh, optimistic about where this, this company is going. When I drilled down and looked at the actual
actual results here. A few things jumped out at me. The first is you have to remember this is a company that's very much based on its marketing spending. When it comes to customer acquisition, it's very important for Blue Apron to continue spending on marketing. And as they've had issues uh, firing up fulfillment centers, spending on building out their operations, they've actually spent less on marketing as a percentage of revenue. You can see here 24.8%. That was the quarter before the IPO. That's the share of revenue that they spent on marketing. Third quarter that came down to 16%, the estimate for the fourth quarter uh, works out to be around 15% of uh, market of revenue going to marketing. And why is that important? Well, when you look at the number of customers Blue Apron has and you look at the amount of customers the company is losing, pre-IPO, they were sitting pretty at about 1 million customers. This past quarter, the third quarter, it's closer to 856,000. So none of those things are good things for a money losing company that's now uh, jockeying against the likes of Amazon and has a uh, fresh competitor, HelloFresh, across the pond that just listed and raised some cash itself. So Alex, what do they need to do to turn the ship around here? So they talked a lot today about uh, building out this Linden Fulfillment Center in New Jersey. They've scrapped plans for another uh, location in California. A lot of talk today was on uh, improving margins and pushing profitability so that they actually have capital to put to use as they continue to build out. That would give them uh, the ability to spend more on marketing and to spend more on acquiring customers uh, as they go forward. So getting to that profitable uh, stake, to that profitable place is important. But again, the stock dive today, some of that's got to be because they thought, uh, they said today their guidance for the second half of the year uh, for net losses, they actually expanded that to uh, a midpoint of about a $135 million just in the second half of the year. That's down by about $10 million more than what they thought just a quarter ago. Why do you think HelloFresh is getting a more positive reception? So when I think back to what HelloFresh has said, they've come out and said, look, we want to be profitable in 15 months. Uh, they, are, they are coming out very confident, saying we're moving into the U.S. market. For these companies, a lot of uh, the onus is on the logistics operations. Blue Apron has stumbled on that hard with this uh, problems with their Linden Fulfillment Center, with these unexpected problems, shutting down uh, plans for the California Center. HelloFresh seems to have have a bit more of their house in order. And if you have the ability to continue building out your operations and pushing from, let's say, HelloFresh's market in Europe into the US, you have a better chance in competing with uh, the smaller players like these two and the specter of uh, Amazon with their new asset, Whole Foods. All right, Alex Barinka, our Bloomberg News IPO reporter there from New York. Alex, thanks so much for the roundup. Coming up, more highlights from the Apple earnings call, which is starting to wrap up. Meantime, check out this live shot. The Apple Store in Sydney. Customers getting their hands on the iPhone 10 for the first time ever. We're going to talk about demand. There are lines in Tokyo, in Singapore, and around the world. This is Bloomberg. Ended the quarter with 268.9 billion in cash plus marketable securities, a sequential increase of 7.4 billion. 252.3 billion of this cash, 94% of the total, was outside the United States. That was Apple CFO Luca Maestri speaking on the Apple earnings call moments ago. Apple reporting results just a day before the iPhone 10 hits the shelves. Demand is high. Expectations may be higher with lines already forming outside stores around the world. We've been watching people getting their hands on the phone for the first time in Sydney and monitoring the earnings call throughout the hour. Apple CEO Tim Cook admitting he can't predict when iPhone 10 supply will meet demand. Joining us now, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who covers Apple. He's been listening to the call. He's been live blogging on the Bloomberg. So, Mark, what are the big headline takeaways uh, in terms of what you've heard over the last hour? You know, it's very interesting. Tim Cook just pretty much said that they don't know if the reason the ship times so, are so long on the iPhone 10 right now is due to low supply or high demand. My prediction is that it's a mix of both, that a lot of people want these things 
and as we reported, it's very difficult to produce because of the OLED screen tech uh, as well as the 3D face recognition scanners. Uh, Cook also told me that he expects that wait times are actually going to go down today or tomorrow as they start to get a better handle on things. And, they, and he, he said he's also very pleased with the ramp up. We're looking at live shots of the Apple Store in Sydney. You see people waiting outside there. We know they're waiting in Tokyo. We know they're waiting in Singapore. When will we have a better idea of how uh, supply and demand will match up? Uh, today, I think, because uh, just a couple of hours ago, I actually noticed on Apple's online website, shipping times in greater China, Germany, uh, Italy, a few other major regions, including the United Kingdom and Australia, are seeing shipping times reduced to three to four weeks, given the five to six week lead time. Unfortunately, three other big regions for Apple, uh, the United States, up north in Canada, as well as Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, we're seeing unavailable uh, status on the website. You have to go to a store. But in the U.S. and Canada, we're actually still seeing that five to six weeks shipping time. So we'll keep an eye out to see when the U.S. will drop down to three to four weeks to match the other regions. There was an important question asked, Mark, about pricing and the fact that Apple now has a ra range of prices for the iPhone, $350 to uh, about $1,000. You know, what is their uh, actual strategy here? How did they lay that out? I mean, the strategy is very interesting. I think they have price points for all sorts of markets. The $350 base price point, I mean, to us, the United States, that might not sound a, like a lot of people, a, a lot of money for the people viewing this show right now for a phone in the United States at the full price. But in places like India and other regions in greater China, developing markets, $350 is still quite a bit of money uh, for a phone. So we'll see if they eventually make a cheaper iPhone below that price for those regions to grow there. Someone was actually asking how they're going to grow even further in China and in India. They keep saying that they're up double uh, year over year in terms of revenues in India, but making a cheaper phone or dropping the price on the SE would help that. Certainly at the high end for early adopters, people who are willing to spend maybe between $30 and $50 per month on a phone, the iPhone 10 is there for them. All right, uh, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, thanks so much for joining us. Again, the iPhone 10 on sale now in Sydney, in Singapore, in Tokyo. Uh, folks there waiting outside the store in Sydney to get inside, get their hands on an iPhone 10. We are going to be covering this for the next 24 hours right here on Bloomberg Television. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, of course, we're live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.